Lily Padilla. Lily is the author of the Anti-Cancer Habits, an anti-inflammatory nutrition book. She's a certified integrative nutrition coach, a holistic nutrition chef with an emphasis in Chinese nutritional therapy. She is also a healthy 19-year cancer survivor. Lily's latest oh. studies and update courses have been focused on the microbiome, gut health, assimilation of nutrients, and functional nutrition. Please help me welcome Lily Padilla. Thank you for being here, Lily. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Nancy. And um, thank you so much for being here today with me and um, in my kitchen. This is the place that I love. Um, I don't know if I'm in the view. Um, yeah, right now. Okay, good. So I'm, um, but I'm with Nancy too. So I don't know if everybody can see me. Uh, oh, there you go. Thank you so much. So welcome everyone. And thank you so much for being here. We have a large group. I'm so happy that you all want to learn. So let's start. Today, I'm going to be speaking about the gut health and the microbiome, one of my fortes and one of my loves. So with that, um, you can see that I'm, you know, surrounded by my loves, which is food. And we will be talking about each of those foods and how they impact actually the microbiome and gut health. But for now, I'm gonna start showing my presentation. So uh, please uh, remember that this is a presentation and it's not intended to provide medical advice. Um, and if you need to change your diet, uh, you wanna consult with your healthcare practitioner first. So with that in mind, um, I want to start the presentation and we will be talking about, like Nancy says, about gut health, nutrition, and the what, when, and how feeding um, and enhancing the microbiome and what actually we shouldn't be eating also or what we should avoid um, in order to help the microbiome. This is me 19 years ago when I had cancer, ovarian cancer, and I just survived with healthy foods and I'm actually focusing on my, at that time we used to call it the intestinal bacteria or the intestinal flora because I did by almost because my sister that is a nurse anesthetist Am I on mute? Am I mute? Did you guys hear me before? Uh, you just went on mute very briefly, but we heard you talking a little bit about um, uh, this is you 19 years ago. Okay, good. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, so I was just showing the photo of how I was 19 years ago. Now you can see me that I'm healthy and, and, and good, but um, also because I focus on real food and gut health. Um, thanks to my sister that it was a or is it a nurse anesthetist? And she always told me your intestinal flora is extremely important. But now with the years we started noticing when I started uh, learning nutrition and taking all these classes on the microbiome that I realized I did the right thing. I focus on my digestive system and my intestinal flora. And um, it really made a big difference in my health. So we need to learn that the digestive system depends also on the microbiome and our eating habits. So we're gonna be talking about that. But as you can see, the digestive system is not just down here, it starts in the mouth. And because it starts in the mouth, we will be talking about a little bit about the microbiome in the mouth also, because this is the first largest site of good bacteria, which is in our gut. But the second one is in our mouth is in all this area and even the esophagus area. So when we talk about salivary glands and when we talk about um, how to improve digestion, this is where it, it really starts. The same way that plants, they have roots and that they uh, are healthy or unhealthy with the, the bacteria and the roots, we do have intestines, which actually, as you can see, they look like the roots of a plant. So funny, uh, the intestines are our roots. They also carry our bacteria. And in plants, it's very similar. So when we talk about food and nutrition, we need to focus on the enzymes also that help us break down those foods into components mm -hmm. that, are, that we are able to digest. So digestion requires the whole body system. You know, it's not just the, only the organs that um, are in the digestive tract, but the endocrine system, 
also the nervous system is involved, the cardiovascular system is involved, of course. Um, so even before we didn't actually count with the healthy microbiome, which um, is, is, it all depends on the diversity of bacteria. But nowadays we do, we know that the microbiome, so what is the microbiome so that we, we get a, 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 a glance at it today. So we have 10 times the number of, it, it outnumbers oh us, the microbiome outnumbers us 10 times um, versus the human cells. So 10 times, remember, we are 10 to one, 10 times more bacterial cells than human cells. And so that's why it's very, very important to feed them well. So the microbes in our gut actually are like our best ally for digestion, for assimilation of nutrients, and also for a healthy body in general. It actually depends on the diversity of beneficial microbes. We depend on them. So when we feed them, we actually have a very good uh, win-win relationship with them. We actually create a, a, a win-win situation at that moment. The digestive system um, is not just digestion and absorption, you know, um, but it's every step of the way to being to, to through the movement of those nutrients, including the water and the electrolytes and and the intestinal um, blood and in the blood and the limbs also. They are all involved in this. So it's very important for us to actually have a lot of the pancreas, the gallbladder, you know, everything moving along in a healthy microbiome in the gut and in the oral microbiome. And you will see how in a moment. So when we talk about, I don't know what is this, but it's bothering me. Uh, let me just move this. Um, can you guys see that? I don't know where it comes from, but okay. So it's not in my, I'm going to, cut the presentation for a second and go back. Hold on a second, I'm trying to show. Okay, it's gone now. All right, so we were talking about what the microbiome is. Um, so here it is the uh, official, um, uh, 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 like what is the microbiome? Officially, this is what it is. Um, in science, they mention it as a community of trillions of bacteria that we have not only in our digestive tract, but in our mouth and our skin. We even have a specific microbes in our eyes. We have a specific microbes in our breast. We have a specific microbes all over the skin. So this is very important that you read at ease and that you understand. But this is a graphic from science telling us uh, what we really is in a visual way. So remember that, 10 to one. So that's why we need to feed them really well and learn what they do and that there are different colonies everywhere. But here is something from the um, public um, um, uh, information for from the gastroenterology and motility uh, European society. So this is a very important part of what we can understand how the microbes work, uh, they work. And when we eat and the foods that we eat get to meet um, our microbes, those foods and our microbes, they start um, in early in life. And also they can impact um, our diet, can impact our diet, our, our microbes, I'm sorry, within days, within a few days of changing diet, we can actually change our microbiome. Not completely, but it starts within days. If we have a consistent, clean eating and high fiber diet. So um, also, yeah, like I was saying, fiber is very important and prebiotics. So beneficial bacteria, which is our ally, not the unhealthy bacteria, but the beneficial bacteria actually try in prebiotic fibers. And we will talk about some of those in a moment, um, and also probiotics and probiotics in food, probiotics and pills, not all the probiotics and pill probiotics work the same for everybody, but they actually modulate our immune system. They can help to modulate, especially prebiotic foods. Um, so also in probiotic foods, like yogurt, like other things that we can eat. So gut bacteria also has an effect on fats. 
and then the inflammatory processes in the body. So when we eat too much fat or unhealthy fats, um, we can actually um, help or not our inflammation in the body, but that's done through bacteria, through the gut bacteria. So diet also changes um, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the microbiome, how we can lose weight or how we can gain weight. So it's not just the foods, microbes are in the middle. They are the middle man, <laughs> per se something. Um, hold on a sec. So they produce the bacteria, they produce short change fatty acids and those short change fatty acids, this is what scientists, and here you can read about it. This is what scientists know so far about the microbiome and, uh, and about the type of short change fatty acids, which are different kinds. Those molecules do a lot of things for us. It all starts when we eat fiber. The more fiber we eat, the more the gut bacteria produces short change fatty acids. So these moleculas actually are very important. The short change fatty acids are extremely important in strengthening the gut barrier. I mean, we can actually help our gut health when, when the bacteria get fed through the, through the fiber that we eat and the, 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 the bacteria will produce short change fatty acids. Again, it's not just fiber directly. Fiber will feed the gut bacteria and the gut bacteria will produce short change fatty acids. And those molecules will strengthen your gut barrier. That's when you can start improving gut health. Your gut barrier is extremely important for general gut health. But it also, the short change fatty acids improve the transit time and they will regulate how we move our intestines. So it's very important. It also helps us to control blood sugar. This is huge, guys. This is huge because we can actually see the changes in pre-diabetics or in people with diabetes or in people that they really just crave sugar so much. So by eating more fiber, more short change fatty acids will be produced by the bacteria. And then we can actually have the benefits through prevent obesity, colon cancer, and lower cholesterol just by eating more fiber. So if you ask me, what is the most important thing that I should be eating? Maybe, I'm not sure about your personal situation and your personal health, but most likely and in general is fiber so that you get the idea. So um, fiber um, and the short chain fatty acids also are very important for our immune system and they help to fight off harmful bacteria. So like I was saying, it protects the colon, but it provides energy to the cells in the colon. So short change fatty acids are extremely important. And some probiotics in food, some probiotics in foods, like, you know, when we do the fermented vegetables, or like when we do um, a lot of the dressings that are made out of just um, fermented vegetables, we can utilize a lot of fiber. And that fiber, even if you just eat yogurt, but you have a lot of fiber for, you know, per se with nuts or like I make my own yogurt, then that at that moment, we can actually help um, the production of short change fatty acids. So remember the gut bacteria, like you can see it right here, <laughs> depends a lot on beneficial fiber. And that fiber converts to short change fatty acids. And those short change fatty acids are something that benefits in general our health. Hmm? So that's something to keep in mind. Okay, so let's talk about some of the studies like this one that is from the Helsinki University, um, the Microbiome Research Department, where they link inflammation with pathogenic bacteria. So go ahead and read for a second. And if you have questions about this, you can write them down in the chat box, you know, like very specific questions about what we're talking. Lily, there was a question asking if you could talk about any specific kind of fiber. Um, I imagine you'll be getting into that in the lecture, but is there any specific kind of fiber that you yeah. are referring to? Yes, yes, that's a good question. Um, some of the specific type of fibers that we're talking about for the short change fatty acids to be produced um, is burdock. So burdock is a root that, uh, as you can see, is not uh, is too starchy, it's actually fibrous and this has uh, inulin. 
So inulin fiber foods are very helpful for the gut microbiome and in general for beneficial bacteria. Okay, let's continue. Any other questions? I no? don't see any others. Okay, good. So we're going to continue with um, how uh, all of us, you know, not just um, not just humans, but also plants and animals, we all uh, digest through enzymes, meaning that we can break things down through enzymes. And the diversity of healthy bacteria actually help us to produce enzymes, not only for digestion, but for all the metabolic processes in our body uh, for us as humans. So um, we need gut bacteria and diversity of gut bacteria in order to, uh, to break down things uh, and produce enzymes. So we have uh, a lot of enzymes that are um, involved also in how we eat and foods and herbs and spices. Some spices actually help us with the production of some enzymes, but um, how the body, um, it contributes to the body's metabolic processes and how we express our genes or our genes are expressed, I'm sorry. So mostly the microbiome genes, not, not just the human genes. So look at the, at the graphic that I'm going to be showing you. Um, and this is very important that you take your time to understand it. Let me know if you have questions about this graphic. We have only 1% of human genes versus 99% of microbial genes. And this is a graphic that I created it, but is based on my studies at Harvard Nutrition School and, and the microbiome classes. So we have only 1% human genes, you know, and 99% microbial genes. So that's a good thing because actually we can change those genes and the expressions of genes with, uh, you know, healthy lifestyle and healthy diet and um, literally turning and uh, tweaking our microbiome to be healthier. So we have, uh, we can even lower inflammation. In my book, I talk about that a little bit, but in reality, I can see this in my clients. I can see it. I can. I saw it in myself, but I can see it in people on a daily basis when they actually help themselves and help their internal ecosystem. The microbiome is actually something that we can um, um, link to many uh, imbalances in the body. But there is growing evidence that a microbial imbalance is associated with intestinal and extra intestinal disorders in the body. So there are many signs and many things that we can look at. These are some of the signs that I'm just putting in and in, in related to digestion and related to inflammation. One of the most common ones that I see is difficulties losing weight. <laughs> when we have dysbiosis or imbalance, dysbiosis means imbalance in the gut microbiome. So the gut help actually can show some signs of imbalances. Same thing with the brain. We now know that many people with depression, and this is something else that, I mean, many, many studies have been showing lately in the last five, six years, that the gut microbiota produces neurotransmitters. And in that actually help us to regulate our mood, can help us to regulate in depression, um, and also to concentrate better. So when we, we, we cannot concentrate we need to think about, am I feeding correctly my microbes? Do I have any imbalances? You know, that's something to think about for a moment. And then let's talk about some of the foods that are including um, certain foods that are, yeah, like we were talking about fiber, but in general, um, what you eat and how and when you eat also matters. It's not just only what you eat, but when you eat. So eating within the circadian rhythms or eating you know, during the day, not eating at nighttime per se, matters a lot. And also remember that we are bio-individuals, meaning that everyone has a unique microbiome. Not everybody will have the same microbiome. So they have different nutritional needs. Everyone, everybody has a different nutritional needs. And that's why the same food can be good for you and maybe not for your brother or your sister. And even although you grow up together, same thing happens in my family, you know, some foods are very unique to me. I have to remember that I had cancer, that I'm a cancer survivor, that I have a specific needs and my microbiome changed the moment that I had cancer. So there are many things to keep 
in mind. And if you have specific questions, you can always, and very personal questions, you can always email me. This is my email right here. And this is my website. So let's continue here. So the same way that the microbiome um, actually uh, has uh, an environment in the gut, they have an environment, a very, a very unique environment in each part of the body. So we can see that there are specific colonies that belongs to our skin. And, and when the skin is out of balance or the environment in the skin is not healthy, then those microbes, they suffer or they start disappearing. Similar to what's going on in the earth, you know, we have certain environment and um, that's where certain fauna and flora, they grow. So when we have an environment in our gut that is not uh, healthy, actually our um, intestinal flora um, or the microbiome, the gut microbiome actually suffers. So we do need to keep in mind that microbes grow in a specific environment and I can control that environment with what I eat and my lifestyle. If you have questions about that, please write down the questions in the chat box. Um, and this is something that I'm going to let you read for a second and ask me questions about this specific Lily, there was a couple of questions here. Somebody asking, um, what does endocrine pancreatic insufficiency do to the microbiome? Are you familiar with that? Um, yeah, that's a very specific uh, personal probably question. But yes, uh, when there is insufficiencies um, or deficiencies, I should say, in, in the body, yeah, the microbes and the environment for the microbes to grow in that specific area, actually um, changes. So they they can not proliferate as they are like, it's the same thing like, like when a, a little, um, in a zoo, they have a specific, um, I don't know, any, any animal that is growing in the zoo and they don't have enough um, food for all of them. So some of them, they will become insufficient or they will become weak. So your microbes actually, um, depend on the balance of all the environment and your foods, your nutrients, and if you are assimilating correctly. So that's something that changes um, for people that are deficient. They are probably are not absorbing or they, they don't have enough enzymes again or metabolic enzymes, not just digestive enzymes, metabolic enzymes for those processes in the endocrine and the pancreatic system but the pancreas by itself produces certain secretes, secretes a lot of enzymes. So we know nowadays that there are specific microbes and, and pathogenic bacteria that can uh, create a problem for the pancreas. Um, so that's very specific. So I don't know the situation of this person to ask the right questions. So the person can you know, email me or um, communicate uh, with me later on. Okay. Great. One other question. Um, you were speaking about burdock root earlier, and somebody was asking, how do you prepare uh, that fiber? Is that yeah. something you're going to go into later in the workshop? Yes, yes, absolutely. We'll we'll talk about food in a moment, and we're going to start actually right now with the diversity. So the more diverse um, our food is and our um, the better for our microbes to create, to proliferate. So think of an ecosystem. The ecosystem of the earth wouldn't be really an ecosystem if we don't have diversity of fauna, flora, and, and species. Same thing here. We're talking about different species. So the more colorful your diet and the different fibers, like in this case, one of the, my major loves and that heal a lot of different things is red cabbage. So red cabbage is one of the best things that we can have actually for our blood is red. So it influences our blood. So like we were talking about the insufficiency of the pancreas. So the yellow color is for the pancreas. So yellow foods with yellow fibers like butternut squash or um, also um, the specific fibers in, um, in kabocha squash are very specific to support the microbiome and the microbes in different organs or the microbes in different systems. So like this one, the yellow foods will be for the stomach, pancreas, and spleen. And the red ones like this one will be for the blood and the cardiovascular system. 
Okay, so let me just continue. But yes, cabbage heals a lot of different things in the body, um, but not everyone can digest cabbage. I have many of my clients saying, oh, I cannot have cabbage. So is it, is that, that's a very general thing to say, because if I take cabbage, and you're gonna see it later on in the presentation, Chinese nutritional therapy and Chinese medicine, Ayurveda also talked for a long time, for hundreds of years, how cooking matters to our digestion and cooking actually matters to our microbiome. That's the latest in science also. So uh, universities like Harvard and Stanford, um, UCLA, they have been doing a lot of studies on how cooking actually will change not only the digestion and the breaking down of the components so that we can assimilate them better, but also how the microbes get nurtured. Microbes don't have teeth, you know? So microbes depend on a lot of broken fiber, broken nutrients and broken components into something that they can actually, um, yeah, get the energy from. So cabbage is one of them. If you have raw cabbage and you have trouble with it, try cook cabbage or really well cooked cabbage, like cabbage soup. So there are many things that will work on that. Let me keep continuing with the with the presentation for a second. So yeah, so we're talking about color. So there are different colors matter to different organs and different systems in the body. But the fibers are actually really beneficial for the microbiome. But the, the rule of thumb is here, whole is better. The more you eat actually whole foods, wholesome foods, that are with all the components together, the better will be nurturing your microbiome. So yes, it's not just fiber. Your microbiome also needs minerals, vitamins, you know, um, and the prebiotic fibers are there. Some of the enzymes, some of the phytochemicals or phy and phytonutrients will be utilized by them as well. So there are many things in food that we need to um, we, we need to keep in mind. So cruciferous vegetables like the cabbage that I was showing you mushrooms, different kinds of mushrooms, shiitake, maitake, you know, white mushrooms, black uh, earwood mushrooms, they all matter to um, all the, especially the onions and the chives, the asparagus, those are fibers that are inulin fibers. So inulin fibers are very specific to help the microbiome and to have a healthy microbiome. But we can also focus on um, you know, fermented foods or what's called um, probiotic foods. So go ahead and read for a second. So there are many kinds. I make my own probiotic yogurt and I make my own fermented vegetables. Um, if you have questions on that, you can also, like I said, uh, ask me a quick question right now, or you can email me. Um, I'll be glad to. Um, I do have a question. Is that okay if I ask real quickly? Oh, um, we'd rather you have them in the chat box. Yes, got it. Thank you. No problem. Uh, Lily, so now, I do. I do see a question in here um, with regards to: um, Is it important to go with organic versus non-organic? And we, what foods are most beneficial for the liver? Okay, uh, and the second, I'll answer that. Yes, the first question, um, yes, uh, you, will, you will see that later on the um, how to avoid things that damage or that can contribute to disrupt the microbiome. Yeah, organic is very important, but not every food should be organic. Uh, we can actually have, um, sorry, we can actually have um, nutritional foods like this ones, like um, some vegetables that like mushrooms, they don't need to be organic all the time. You know, um, Hikama depends, but you don't need the skin of hikama. So if you can like change the skin of like uh, plantains or bananas. Um, so like in this case, I have my plantain here for a reason. Um, hold on a minute. Okay, so plantains, um, especially when they are green, this one just became yellow like two days ago. <laughs> um, but when they are uh, green, they are a prebiotic fiber, but I don't need the skin. So if I don't find it organic, I don't worry about that. Um, so not everything has to be organic, but some foods like uh, that they that that you eat the skin or is very thin, the skin like asparagus, 
like green beans have a lot of pesticides, like salary has a lot of pesticides, I will go organic with that because uh, that has an impact on how we actually uh, preserve our gut bacteria. And so inulin foods for the most part, like um, onions, chives, asparagus, I'll keep them organic. Burdock, I peel it most of the time. So, you know, if I don't find it organic, I will put it in water with vinegar. But um, for the most part, like broccoli sprouts, you know, things like that, watercress, they are very sensitive to, they don't grow well in pesticides. So, but things that are very common, like corn or soy or potatoes, um, they have heavy pesticides. So I will, I will try not to go with that. I will go with organic in that case. Um, and the other food, the other question about the liver, yeah, there are so many specific foods for the liver, but some of these ones, they work. Now, it depends on what is the condition in the liver or if it's just to nurture the liver or if it's just to clean the liver. So that's a very general you know, question right there. Um, but um, yeah, so I will, for making yogurt or for eating fermented vegetables, I will go organic. Any other questions? So there is a question about, is there a lot of salt in fermented food like miso? It all depends on which miso you get. But there are some specific misos and natos. Natto is a Japanese uh, food also that I use. Um, uh, so it all depends on, on which brand you get. Um, and they have some that are very salty, that's true. And some that are not as much. Now you can control that by the amount that you use. Like if I didn't get a miso that it was low in salt, then I use very small amounts and I control that in my bowl of soup or in my bowl of uh if i'm making a dressing because i make dressing with miso also yeah all right let's continue we have plenty of stuff to go through so um and in boosting digestion these are some of the things that i want to point out um in in the first one is become an expert at chewing chewing is uh is the moment is the beginning of digestion and is the mixing the saliva with the enzymes and if you didn't know, you, we will go through that. Uh, our oral microbiome is right there present. So um, chewing is one of the best things that you can do if you wanna stimulate your digestion or have better digestion in general. But the other one is to learn to manage stressful situations and avoid the stressful situations if you are eating. So the moments of eating used to um, you know, uh, try to be a calm, and, and to manage uh, the food combinations as well. Too many combinations of too many ingredients in one meal, if the person is not, is having sensitive digestion, might not be the best. Um, and how the food is prepared, I should say. Um, so avoid feeding bad unhealthy bacteria, which too much sugars or with things, you're gonna see the list in a moment of the things that we're supposed to avoid um, or to minimize. And feed your friendly bacteria, focus on that. So avoid foods with pesticides, which we were just talking about, um, and, and especially the foods that are carry uh, genetically modified um, ingredients um, like uh, wheat, uh, especially some types of um, wheat that are um, grown in massive amounts and, and the uh, same thing with the soy that is growing in massive amounts. They have quite a bit, uh, or they are GMOs, or they have quite a bit of glyphosate. Glyphosate has been linked to very poor diversity of bacteria and uh, in very poor concentration as well lately. So I, I kept a lot of attention to this uh, because that is one of the major things. They compare in some uh, nutrition magazines glyphosate with antibiotics. It's very similar. So just to give you an example. So eat probiotic foods and prebiotic fibers and probiotic foods. Prebiotic, probiotic is the species or the strains. And prebiotic is the food for those strains, just in case you didn't know. But you can ask me questions about that. The other thing for assimilation is, is smaller meals digest better. So we don't wanna tax the digestive system. And especially if you don't have a good healthy bacteria, um, then you wanna go and prevent with, and go with um, smaller meals throughout the day. Depends on your case. Again, I'm not prescribing and I'm not, I don't know your case, so I'm just being very general. And the things that we know, overeating feeds more yeast and fungi um, and other opportunistic parasites. So overeating and especially eating at nighttime might not be a good thing. So in probiotics, we know that they are very unique. Even 
the yogurts that I recommend, they are very unique to my uh, clients when I know their gut, when I know what's convenient for them. Um, same thing with me. I go with my, my spe specific probiotics for my age, specific probiotics for the type of uh, digestion that I have and my health conditions. So if I have any health condition, I'll probably change that. Uh, like to give you an example on this on probiotics, um, not long ago, we find out and many research that one specific probiotic, one species only, is very unique for iron absorption. So there you go. If, if I had a client that they have iron absorption issues, I will give them that probiotic and not a general probiotic that is from the store. So that's just to give you an example. But the same thing is with bone health. There are specific probiotics for osteoporosis. So when I teach my classes on osteoporosis, I actually make yogurt with sometimes with that specific probiotic so I can multiply that probiotic. <laughs> um, because I'm a cancer survivor and, and I need to you know, be you know, uh, very gentle with my body also and learn to feed my um, good bacteria. So we were talking about fiber and how it improves digestion. So um, when people, they say it about burdock, so here it is, please read this. And if you want to know more about burdock and how I cook it, let me explain this to you. I hope that you can read that, that you read already that. So burdock, I peel it with a peel, carrot peeler. And I actually cut it in, in thin slices, just like carrots. I mix it with carrots and I make it in a stir fries. I cook it for only seven minutes to my taste because I like it still a little crunchy, but you can cook it a little longer if you want uh, or if you have difficulty you know, chewing. Um, it will be 10 minutes and then I add my carrots and then I add my leafy greens. So one of the easiest things to do is to combine that in a quick stir fry with kale, with red cabbage. And you can see, you know, it's not that difficult to create a really delicious, um, healthy um, stir fry. Uh, but a healthy, a healthy stir fry wouldn't be finished without onions. So I'm putting two prebiotic fibers right there with inulin in my gut. So the same thing is with um, garlic. So if I put garlic, I'm complementing that. So eating healthy stir fries is so good for our gut because they are cooked. And so um, it is when I add mung beans or um, any small bean that is easy to digest. So a lot of people, when they tell me, I cannot digest beans, I have you know gas issues or whatever, I say, go with sprouted. So as you can see, I'm sprouting my own um, mung beans, and they are the easiest. And they are talking about a healthy food for the liver, mung beans. Mung beans are healthy and detoxifying for the liver, but they are a cooling food, meaning that they can cool off your digestion and, and your whole body actually, and they cool off a healthy, a, a overheated liver also. So I combine them with onions and garlic to not, to balance my environment. Remember how I said that the environment is all for the microbiome? Okay, here it is, something very important. When I do bulldog, I actually wash it with cold water to preserve it white in the middle. It's very good. Um, you can just treat it as a carrot, kind of like a very tough carrot, you know, just to give you an idea. So let's continue here. So we're talking about bulldog because it's an inulin fiber um, and um, chicory also contains inulin. So um, you can buy jicama or you can buy other inulin foods. Um, hold on a second. And do combinations. So food combinations matter for digestion. Like I was saying, too many ingredients might not be good and overeating can be um, feeding the unhealthy bacteria when the digestion gets um, fermented. So fermented digestion, you don't want. You want enzymatic digestion. So it's totally different than when I do make a one pot meal. So this is a one pot meal. You can see the array of different colors in here. And also you can see that there is a lot of food. So you might say, how come you're saying, you know, food combining? Yeah, it's different when we cook all together in one pot and we break down the different enzymes or the different um, components of that food in the pot, in the heat. 
uh, all together. So the digestion will become like one for that specific one pot meal. But if I serve all these ingredients individually cooked in different pots, it's different. And that is purely Chinese nutritional therapy in, in practice. This is what we do when we are actually having a person that is sensitive. We do more like soups, like stews, and like one pot meals. So that's that's a food combination matters. But also, like I was tell, I was talking about what helps the most for in general our health and in general our microbiome is a complete spectrum plant diet, meaning more whole grains, more whole beans, vegetables, fruits, mushrooms, nuts, and algae as well. Like I was saying, if we need organic uh, uh, animal foods, it's perfect. It doesn't matter. Some people, they might like it. Some people, they, they are vegans. I don't know. But in general, eating colorful, wholesome foods is what we're looking for in order to benefit our microbiome and our gut health. So Lily, yes. Lily, I'm sorry to interrupt. There is a request if you could go back to slide 35 or 36. Um somebody was asking um what was on that slide well um can i finish this in a moment i'll do that let me sure. just finish the prebiotic fibers the prebiotic uh why the pre the fibers and the prebiotic foods are very important because they stimulate the growth of beneficial bifidobacteria and lactobacillus so when we have more bifidobacterium and lactobacillus growing in our gut uh, that these guys are actually suppressing the pathogenic bacteria. So we don't need to have too many um, maybe medications or too many things depending on what we are eating and if we actually stay with more prebiotic foods and foods that contain inulin. Let me see if I can um, figure out which one is the 35. <laughs> I don't have the 35. I have that, only 36. That one your arrow is on right now is 35. And that one right there is, I oh, believe, the, what the one right afterwards she's looking for 36, probably. This one? About burdock. Yes. OK, what, again, I think I just explained about burdock. Yeah, maybe just that she wanted to see it one more time. But um, okay. all right. But I do know we have quite a bit to cover and I see quite a bit of questions that I know you won't be able to get to everything. So yes. why don't we continue? And when you're ready to take some more questions, Lily, I have a few in the chat box. Perfect. Thank you. So I just want to make you aware that we need to uh, keep, don't kill off uh, uh, the healthy microbes because the, the foods that we eat um, can, you know, when if we eat uh, foods with pesticides, um, so we need to make sure that we know that the healthy bacteria survives. So there are processed foods and genetically modified foods, sugars, wheat, and factory farm meats um, with antibiotics that they can actually damage the or disrupt the microbial balance. So I just want to make you aware of that too. Um, and again, I focus on more whole and chlorophyll foods. Um, this is probably one of the major things that I see in juicing is that people throw away the fiber. So we don't want to throw away the fiber. We want to actually make more smoothies if that's what you do, if that's what you like, if that's what you helps your digestion. I don't know, but um, I do this mainly in spring and summer. In winter, it's better for us to eat cooked foods and cooked foods like uh, soups and um, soups and uh, stews and warm foods um, actually help us to have better digestion. So in chewing, we talk about chew well until liqu liquefy each bite. And that's one of the major things because the stomach doesn't have teeth. So you want to have better energy and better immunity and you know better gut bacteria. Chew well. Your gut bacteria doesn't have teeth either. So it, it all depends on how we chew and how we uh, eat and, and, and what... Uh, type of, uh, of foods we're putting. If, if it's processed foods, they are not alive. So eat, eat, eat foods that are alive to control the yeast. Yeast likes processed foods. 
yeast and too much fungi in our system, it creates more toxicity. So remember that uh, we can digest enzymatically or fermentively. If we have too much yeast and too much bad bacteria and you have bloatiness or uh, you, know, you feel tired after you eat, you're digesting fermentively, not enzymatically. And that's a problem. We should be light and we should be feeling okay after we uh, eat. Uh, so that's one of the proofs right there. How do you feel after you eat? If you're too sleepy or you're tired or you're bloated, something is going on, is wrong. So other things that remember is that the goal in this is to find the imbalance or symbiosis. Symbiosis of the gut bacteria is the same way as having balance. So if you have questions about this, you can email me. But here are some eating guidelines. So please read um, and uh, take a note if you want on this. So eating, sitting down, you know, eating without distractions, um, eating foods that help our microbiome and avoiding the simple sugars. And by all means, you know, eating more to feed the diversity of bacteria means diversity of foods. So if I actually show you what I eat the most, you can see that a lot of the colors in my uh, in my kitchen is because um, I actually am eating to help my digestive system. And um, like I avoid gluten, but if I eat gluten and rye, it's okay with me. So eating, if I eat wheat, it's not okay with me. I don't know how is your digestion, but you can actually see that if you have digestion, uh, you know, issues like acid reflux or, you know, gallstones or diverticulitis, then, then something is going on right now, you know? So and at that moment, you want to strengthen your microbiome. And there are many things that you can do for that. You know, there are my, the microbiome, the entire microbiome actually can um, be affected. Well, we get a new gut lining every three to five days. So, you know, you can change from one week to another what you eat and you can see an improvement right there. Um, nurture your microbiome with exercise, but don't overdo it. You know, uh, make sure that you remember that the second largest site of bacteria in your whole body is in your mouth. So the most bacteria in the mouth are protecting us, are protecting what enters the body and what actually will go down to the gut. So uh, from the gums to you know, the tonsils to the teeth, you know, check how is your gut uh, bacteria, your, your mouth bacteria, because that's going to become your gut microbiome later on also. So we see a lot of bacteria, a lot of species that are in the mouth, they end up in the gut. So the healthier your mouth and your oral microbiome are, the healthier your gut, also your immune system. We see a correlation in between many inflammatory diseases that bothers the immune system or that bothers the brain uh, and the health of the, um, the, the mouth of the person. So go ahead and read for a second. Okay, so we talk about eating whole, but we didn't talk about what to avoid. So here it is. This is the list of the things that we're supposed to be avoiding. And also um, minimizing radiation will be good in the sense of too much exposure to technology, especially at nighttime. That's something uh, like the latest studies is showing. But eating light, especially at nighttime, also helps uh, the digestion and it helps the microbiome. But eating late and eating large amounts of food at nighttime or overeating in general might actually feed pathogens um, in both, in the mouth and in the gut. One really little tip here right now is if you are uh, craving too much after you finish eating, go ahead and brush your teeth because at that moment you're stopping the pathogens or the bacteria in your mouth from asking you for more sugars or um, you're actually controlling, telling them, I'm not going to eat more. So that way, we have seen a very good result by brushing the teeth after we finish eating and not waiting until late at night. And also, remember that 70% of your immune system is located around your digestive tract. So uh, poor chewing, like I was saying, or toxins, too many toxins, um, or not detoxifying you know, from toxicity that we have from many things, 
um, can be bad also for your uh, immune system and your gut bacteria. So candida, we talk about that and late eating, that's another thing that is very important to remember. Remember that the microbiome and the friendly bacteria have a very strong positive influence in your immunity, your digestive system, your assimilation of nutrients, vitamins production, yes, the microbes produce vitamins on us, yes. Uh, detoxification, brain health. And so if you think that you are missing microbes, please try to find your balance and create ways to increase good bacteria and balance your immune system, your uh, digestive system. This is my book. If you have questions, um, I'm going to take the latest questions because the time is almost over. And also, this is my information. You can um, sign up for a free consultation. If you didn't get to ask the questions or you didn't get answers to your questions, please email me. This is my email. And this is, you can text me um, to set up a free consultation if you have, if you would like to do that. Um, and this is my website that you can visit. Also, my Instagram is right here. Um, and again, it all depends on what we eat, but cook food has been shown in the latest studies in many um, universities um, and the microbiome department. So when we eat more fermented foods and we actually um, increase the amount of fiber, specifically um, uh, inulin fibers, we feel better and we can start the process of tweaking the microbiome for a healthier microbiome. Okay, any questions? Lily, yes, there's several in the chat box and we may not be able to get to all of them, but um, they are asking where one can purchase your book. <laughs> <laughs> sure, um, Amazon will be the best bet. Yeah, and I have it also, yeah, and Amazon is, is the best. Mm -hmm. Okay, and what food should we not eat? Yeah, uh, like I was saying, um, for, uh, processed foods, sugar, too much sugary foods in one meal, or um, you know, if you already have yeast overgrown, then you probably want to back off on too many um, sugary foods. That's one of them. But um, too much of the genetically modified foods also can be a problem for the person that is already with sensitive digestion or have not diversity of foods. And so eating always the same of the same can be a problem if you want to have a diverse microbiome. You need diversity of foods. You know, you want to have diversity of colors in your diet. Definitely, you want to have diversity of fibers and textures. So learning about shopping differently in your store and looking at your car and your car is full of colors. So that means that you are eating phytonutrients and the person that is not that is eating processed foods or too much flowers and uh, baked goods that are uh, from the stores, they're not eating phytonutrients. So they have less diversity of bacteria. And is there anything specific for those who are diabetic um, with regards to either food or any general comments with regards to someone being diabetic? Okay, for eating or avoiding? I, I'm not sure of the question. I think this one is in general, so it could be either. Okay. So asking any general, any general comments to diabetics? Okay. Um, in, in diabetes and in pre-diabetes, uh, we see that the tweaking or the um, improving the gut bacteria and the diversity of phytonutrients also matters to them. But one of the major things is eating more bitter foods. So if I see it from the standpoint of Chinese nutritional therapy, uh, bitter foods actually counteract um, sugars and can stimulate the pancreas a little bit. So eating also sugary foods or not sugary foods, sweet foods like the um, squashes actually are very good for the pancreas. So instead of eating a piece of bread per se, a white bread, uh, they can eat a slice of kabocha at night time or in dinner time or at lunch time and or, or butternut squash. Um, another good food for diabetics is um, dandelion greens. Yeah. Okay. And are there any tests that someone can take to determine what might be missing in their microbiome? Yes. Of course, yeah. So there are several companies that they do tests. I have my favorite ones, <laughs> but um, 
I, I go with the most scientific test, which is the NRS-16, which is the DNA microbiome test. Um, it depends on what is the person looking for, so I will have to ask questions, but um, they can email me and I'll be glad to send them the link of different companies. Mm -hmm. Okay, and do you have any opinion on intermittent fasting? Yes, intermittent fasting, uh, depending on the amount of hours, can be very healthy for most people. But if you are in treatments or you're a cancer survivor, depending on how long ago you finished treatments, you have to be careful. Um, if, you, if you feel too weak, I will say in winter is not as healthy because you need more calories. Um, so you have to be careful with that. If you're a regular person and you have you know, plenty of body uh, fat and um, you don't feel weak, um, intermittent fasting can be healthy at least for most people. I say, you know, again, it's not, it's very tricky because I don't know some people, they don't do well with fasting. Um, like I have a client that just not long ago, she finished uh, a treatment with antibiotics and she didn't do well. She started a fasting and then all of a sudden she called me, it's like, I don't know why I'm feeling so bad. I'm like, what are you doing? So I didn't know what she was doing. So just to give you an example, any type of specific medications or or things that makes you cold or that things that makes you weaken your digestion might not be the best um like you know if an intermittent fast for intermittent fasting so intermittent fasting is very good when you control and is um um giving breaks you know not all the time and and it's starting from little by little adjusting the time not not all at once like whoa the whole day or you know, people that they can do two days, that, that's not intermittent fasting, that is a heavy fasting. So intermittent fasting is a few hours, you know, start with the 12, then probably go to uh, 14 or 15. Like I do very well 18 hours, um, but I do it like every 10 days or every 15 days. And that really sets me back. You know, I can see that, but it's not for everyone. So if you have questions on that, please ask. Okay. Do you have time for a couple more questions? Sure, I have time. I just don't know your end. Your end. I don't want to take too much time. I'm sorry. Okay. Well, I do see several questions asking about guidance on a probiotic, or if you have a recommendation for a probiotic. Sure, absolutely. I do. Like I was saying, um, I not long ago, um, eight nine years ago, I started taking all the uh, probiotics and um, and the lifespan of our microbiome with Harvard Nutrition School in Boston. And um, of course, with the pandemic, I stopped, but I, I went back and now um, every year there, I, there are new updates and it's very beautiful to see how now they can pinpoint in a specific probiotic or specific um, strains, how they can merge and work together for specific diseases or, or conditions in the body. So it's very advanced and scientific. So I cannot tell you one a specific one, but I can show you like $2.99. <laughs> I have one just in case people ask. And this is one of my favorites right now. It's called $2.99. And $2.99 is very specific for bloatiness. So you can see that this is a very general for bloatiness. And there are other ones that are, like I said, for uh, absorption of specific nutrients like uh, or minerals, like iron is an issue, a huge issue in our country. So, so there are specific ones. I really like a mix of bifidobacteriums and lactobacillus and a little bit of streptococcus thermophilus on it. So meaning when you have more bifidos, let me explain this very quickly. We have through the lifespan of our life, we, in, we start with 95% bifidobacterium in our gut. That's the way when we are babies. Throughout the years, when we grow and when we are teenagers, we start losing some. But uh, by the age of 49, 50 years old, we have probably half of the bifidobacterium that we need. And when we are 65 or 70, we end up with maybe 20, 25%. So we need more bifidobacteriums and more lactobacillus in one probiotic. If that's what you're asking me for a very general, I'll say go with you know, some species. Not that that is very specific to your health, I'm not prescribing here. This is only just to respond to that question. But bifidobacteriums, different kinds, do a lot of good to our gut health in general. Okay. Last questions, because I do want to be so respectful of your time. 
Um, somebody is asking about any food recommendations for someone who has uh, parents with failing memory or foods that would help, I guess, with memory um, very, in the elderly. Very good question. Um, I totally understand. My mother is 95 <laughs> and I have been working with her and some probiotics and specifically with fermented foods. So um, fermented foods are very good for um, elderly. And um, we know that Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, dementia has been linked to the microbiome. If you, um, well, no, I don't think you can, but um, I do take classes with the Helsinki University, like, like you saw. Um, and uh, one of the teachers there, uh, one professor that he was here in, uh, in the United States teaching, he actually linked Parkinson's and dementia with missing bacteria and constipation. So if the person suffers constipation throughout their lives, most likely they will have more um, you know, mental issues as, as elderly. So starting early in life is very good. But if the person is already elderly, we need to improve their um transit time and uh and stools and we need to make sure that we have plenty of either or yogurt not or i, I will say both yogurt and fermented foods and miso that those three are very helpful if especially in soups you know uh like miso soup daily uh that will be helpful for more concentration because there are specific bacteria in there but also um yeah, I, I think that a yogurt, a, a vegetarian or vegan yogurt will be more helpful than a dairy yogurt for some elderly. Mm -hmm. oh, thank you, Lily. I know that you're very good at answering emails and responding to people who interact with you through your website. Could you put that slide back up again uh, um, sure. so uh, others can yeah. jot that down? And sure. then, of course, wanting to thank you for your time and even going over tonight um, with answering those questions. Oh, you're um, very welcome. I actually want to thank the um, the South Bay Survivorship uh, Consortium for putting together this uh, presentation. Uh, I know that is very important for cancer survivors. I'm one of them, and I really enjoyed supporting our community. Um, and others, of course, as well. But thank you so much for inviting me. This is my information. You can um, request a free consultation or not. Just simply, you know, send your questions to lpadillacreate at gmail.com. And I'll be glad to respond. Um, I re will respond usually um, as, you know, in the order that the emails come. So probably, you know, in the next two days or three days, we will be responding emails. Um, and, and if you have an interest in a free consultation, you can text at this number and um, I will be glad to, um, you know, email you or text you back. Um, so thank you so much. I really appreciate that. Like I said, this is my information um, and this is my book that you can find at um, Amazon.com. Um, I have different chapters that they speak. I have a specific chapter here about digestion. And um, I mentioned a lot about the microbiome and my book also has recipes if you're interested or if you want a specific recipes for your health conditions or know most about like the liver question or like the pancreas question, more beneficial foods or the way the cooking methods. And that's my forte is, is, is how to treat food, is how to ingest foods that are beneficial for the individual uh, you know, uh, benefit or the individual issues in health. So uh, I really thank you for being here today. I appreciate so much uh, the opportunity to teach again and to see you all. Thank you so much and happy new year, guys. <laughs>